Um, and now we're on to the main event, and I'm very happy to welcome Jesse Clark and Kathy Eric today. Uh, we're very excited for your talks, and I'd just like to quickly introduce you both. So um, Jesse is a senior geologist at BHB in the Olympic Dam Mine. Um, he received his BSc from the University of Adelaide with a first class honours researching IOA and IOCG systems in the Northern Gorilla Craton uh, in 2014. And in 2019, he completed his MSc in Economic Geology from the National Master's Program at the University of Tasmania, Coates. But Jesse began his career at BHP in 2015 and now has over six years experience working on ICG deposits in the Gorilla Craton. Um, he has had several publications, numerous conferences and ICG workshops. And his efforts have focused on understanding the structural connection to the formation and the preservation of Olympic Dam and relating this back to holistic exploration models to discover new ICG deposits. During his time as Olympic, at Olympic Dam, Jesse led the development of the first fully integrated 3D geological model, the entire deposit, including a revised regional to deposit scale structural model um, and structural architecture. Uh, as well as his contributions to the Olympic Dam, Jesse is also a passionate member of the Society for Economic Geologists, serving on multiple committees and as an active member. Um, and now our second speaker for today, Kathy Erig. Um, Kathy completed her undergraduate studies in California and her PhD in geology at the University of California, Berkeley in 1991. Quickly after, she ventured down under to the enigmatic and extraordinary uh, Olympic Dam deposit. In 1992, uh, Kathy joined the former Western Mining Corporation as a research geologist to work on the genesis of the Olympic Dam deposit and to provide mineralogical support for the Olympic Dam processing plant. Uh, in 2006, Kathy moved to lead the development of the Olympic Dam Geometallurgy Geo Program in Adelaide, where she is now the Superintendent of Geo Geometallurgy. Um, and over the past 28 years, Kathy has been uh, very focused on using the mineralogy to solve processing issues, unraveling the complex history of the Olympic Dam deposit, and using deposit scale geological and mineralogical insights to, um, to inputs uh, and new, discovery, uh, new discoveries of ICG deposits. Kathy has also passed on her huge knowledge by co-supervising PhD students and postgraduate researchers uh, working on the Olympic Dam-based um, projects and also co-authoring numerous publications and presentations. Uh, in 2017, Kathy's contribution to the geological and geometallurgical understanding of Olympic Dam was recognized with the um, Professional Excellence Award from the uh, Oz IMM and a degree uh, of Doctor of Science uh, Honoris from the Flinders University. Um, as well as this, she was uh, honored in 2018 when she was awarded the Geological Society of Australia's Bruce Webb Medal um, and became a Chartered Professional of the Oz IMM. And earlier uh, this year, she was also awarded the Society for Economic Geologists Silver Medal. So uh, with this incredible experience from both Jesse and Kathy, we're very happy to have you both here today. And it's a fantastic opportunity for all of us um, to hear from you both, the exceptional geologists, uh, to lead us into the geology of the iconic IOCG deposit, which is Olympic Dam. So thank you very much. And then uh, I'll pass it over to you both. Right. Uh, thank you, Alana, and thank you, Marion, and welcome to Carolina, the new joining in here. We also want to thank the Ore, Ore Deposits Hub Organizing Committee for inviting us to, to present here. It's a fantastic opportunity, and we see the work that the Ore Deposits Hub has done. It's a new model for the future going forward as far as how presentations will go and how new conferences might unfold. So it's a great opportunity, and thanks. Today, Jesse and I are going to talk to you about the, Olymp the geology at Olympic Dam. And we'll first start with this little, this photo, which was, is one of my more favorite ones. The height of it is about 35 millimeter. A nice polished example showing black material, which is this uh, hematite rich mudstone, barite rich sediment layer in that, and then some nice pyrite and with a little tiny bit of calcopyrite. And the question that we often have at Olympic Dam chemical precipitate or just ultra fine grain material. We don't know a lot. A lot of times it's very difficult to tell. 
And then also a nice little snap in here is a little bit of deformation in these, in these sediments that occur within the deposit. But we're gonna continue on. First of all, we have a few, I was on the wrong side, thanks, Jesse. A few acknowledgements that we wanna go through that all the uh, views and opinions here expressed here are solely ours, that, that we acknowledge the vast amount of work that has been done by over 130 geoscientists that have worked at Olympic Dam since the discovery in 1975. Since about 2008, we've engaged, engaged acti actively with academia, including a whole swag of colleagues from the University of Tasmania and also from the University of Adelaide. We've been supported by the South Australian government, the Australian Research Council colleagues at Anstow University of Melbourne, CSRO, and, and other ARC grants, Australian Research Council grants. So it's, it's we certainly built on the, the shoulder of giants before us. The classic disclaimer that all of us in the industry need to do. And so you read it quickly and we're not held responsible. Now, we'll launch on to about Olympic Dam. Why do we actually care about Olympic Dam and why do we love it so much? And we wanna uh, share with you why we love it and why you should love it also. Olympic, these three graphs to show the relative size of Olympic Dam uh, compared to some of the other biggest deposits around, but Olympic Dam is kind of three or four deposits in one, probably more than that. The left-hand diagram, uranium, we are by far the world's largest uranium deposit and 25 to 30% of the world's declared uranium resources actually sit within our deposit. We're in the top five of the copper deposits in the world and the top five of the gold deposits. And when you combine all these together, these bars will shift around a little bit with time, but it, that doesn't matter. Um, if you can take our total combined uranium, copper, and gold together and, and lump that up, we actually have more value than what Chuki Kamada's got or Escondida, and we only fail, fall back to uh, Rilsk, which is the largest metalliferous deposit on this planet. Um, so we'll, so we'll step back and, and we'll have a bit of an introduction behind the essential ingredients for giant IOCG deposits. And we'll, we'll look back to David Groves and others' work in 2010, the seminal paper on IOCG systems. Um, this is very relevant to Precambrian Gorlocraton IOCG deposits. This figure on the left um, from Groves et al. 2010, we see the zone of partial melting in the metasomatized SCLM. Um, and this, uh, for the Gawler Craton deposits was the onset of the Gawler Large Igneous Province at about 1595. Um, this <clears throat> then has staged uh, uh, magma um, chambers as you go up through the crust, um, but most significantly is this parental ultramafic source magma, um, which is uh, volatile rich and the result of, of mantle and the plating. So the partial melting of these volatile rich and possibly metal and rich um, alkaline ultramafic magmas um, provide a lot of the metal content and it's the variable degrees of mixing with these magmatic fluids and other crustal fluids uh, that form along um, particularly the lower crust and are transported by regional scale fluid flow paths. Um, <clears throat> so if we apply this to the Gawler Craton, here is the Olympic copper gold metallogenic province by this black dashed line. Um, so the northern extents are poorly understood how far it goes to the north, but we can separate the domain uh, into three separate subterranes. So we've got the Mount Woods domain in the north, uh, which hosts a prominent hill deposit, which Tobias gave a good talk on uh, last week, um, and, a, and a number of numerous other prospects. In the south, we have the, the historic Mutawalaru mines um, in the hillside deposit. These are mostly magnetite rich and member IOCG systems. Um, variable IOA st uh, style. And then we have the main Olympic domain where Olympic Dam is hosted um, along with a plethora of prospects ranging from IOA type systems through to the shallow hematite end members. So most important uh, points in the Gola Craton, this IOCG belt formed along the Eastern Craton margin within about a hundred kilometers of, of the main Archean nucleus of the Gola Craton. Uh, and we see a large volume of oxidized A-type fludons, which are characterized as this red, which is the Hiltuber suite, uh, felsic granitoids, and their mafic, ultramafic um, 
equivalents, which are juvenile magmatic input manifested as these mafic, ultramafic intrusions and basalts. And we have an abundance of mafic volcanics in the low, lower Gola Range volcanics in the Olympic domain. Um, but importantly, these magmatic rocks intruded uh, the basement. And these, this brown and green unit represents uh, the 1740 MA Wallaroo group, which is a series of iron rich metapelites and biffs um, and variable carbonate units. Um, now, the Geological Survey have done a lot of work characterizing these units. Uh, and Reed and Fabrice summarized that most, most, most of the time, especially through the Olympic domain, these iron rich equivalents um, are very low metamorphic grade and contain their original formation waters. So, this is a very fertile geochemical environment into which to emplace very high temperature felsic and mafic magmas to generate um, quite voluminous hydrothermal cells. Um, but we also have evidence for um, an older, earlier metasomatized SCLM. Uh, and this is an image generated over you know, the last 20 years of some excellent work that the, the Geological Survey and others have, have put together in the geophysical space. And this is numerous seismic lines, um, potential, potential field modeling and electrical methods. And there was an excellent summary paper last year uh, which summarized the extent of the interpreted metasomatized mantle, which is the green. We can see the IOCG systems are the triangles here, and they sort of develop along this boundary between this blue domain, which is interpreted as um, highly hydrated um, lower crust. And so Olympic Dam is this larger triangle with Carapatina in the south and prominent here in the north. As we step down to a camp scale, we can see the underlying structural control of these systems and also the, the 1590 Gawler Large Igneous Province um, is this northwest structures that are across the eastern margin of the Gawler Craton. These are likely Neo-Archean or Paleoproterozoic in age. Um, they have an intimate control on the overall geometry um, of the ISCG systems, but also it's at the intersection of these younger east-northeast um, interpreted to have activated during the Mesoproterozoic Gawler event. Um, it's at these intersections where we concentrate most of the magnetism, but also where we have the highest chances of our latency and, and, and the ISCG systems form. Good. These deposits in here, the purpose of uh, further continuing on with this is that the deposits, the IOCG deposits, are not related to any one specific host. And this is a fine example there. So Olympic Dam sits in the hill of the Sweet Granite, 1590. Acropolis, which is off to the southwest, sits in the, the Gullah Range volcanics of the Felsic Lava, 1590. Weirdo Well, you just continue around a little bit to the left, sorry, to the right. Sits in Donington Sweet Granitoids, 1860 to 1840, 1840 million years. Then further along, Island Dam sits in the, these Wallaroo meta sediments and meta volcanics, 1770. Oak Dam West, Oak Dam East, two little deposits next to each other in the, in the Donington Granitoids again. Carapatina in the Donington Granitoids and Emmy Bluff down at the bottom of the, of the picture is in the Wallaroo meta sediments. All of these things contain pyrite, capopyrite. Some contain bornite, and then some more also have bornite caposite. The age of the mineralization of both of the sulfides is, is 1590 million years. So zooming now down into the deposit scale, on the left-hand side is the uh, geological map at about 350 meters beneath the surface. And the Olympic Dam deposit actually sits under 350 meters of what we call the cover sequence, which is unaltered, undeformed, uninteresting, but that's kind of a, a side joke, but it's, 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 they're about a billion years younger than the deposit. The deposit is a tectano-magmatic hydrothermal breccia-hosted iron oxide IOCG. Uh, the breccia complex, which is defined by that, that gray area, the light gray area in there, and that boundary in there, within that we call that, the, the, um, sorry, the, the Olympic Dam breccia complex outside of it is the Roxby Downs granite, and that boundary is roughly defined by the, the final disappearance of magmatic biotite. We have no hydrothermal biotite at Olympic Dam. 
The footprint though of that Breccia complex is about 50 square kilometers. Within that is hosted the, uh, the deposit and the deposit's rough outline is what's called that orange dash one, give it, give it a will. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, that orange out, dash outline, that's all of our uh, resources within that. And that has about six kilometer long strike length, about three kilometers wide and about 800 meters depth to the bottom of it in most places. But we do have mineralization down as far as about 2.3 kilometers off in, off in the southeast corner of the deposit. There is an unequivocal spatial correlation between iron, copper, gold, uranium, silver, and a whole swag of other hydrothermal elements. And it's across the deposit and due to probably roughly co-precipitation of these elements. Olympic Dam, like all other copper, all, all other deposits are actually mineralogically zoned. And when we look at the edges of the deposit going in, it's really, it's a big iron metasomatism system where we've taken a Roxby Downs granite or granite and altered it to very iron rich materials. So we really, a lot of our descriptive system is based around the iron content or the hematite content of the rock. But there's all sorts of sub um, groupings of, of alteration in there. The earliest formed is magnetite apatite chlorite with some other, other minerals in it, but we're going from a, a reduced facies association. So Fe plus two, and the system then becomes swamped by the Fe plus three, which is hematite and sericite. Other zonation that we see there is siderite fluorite apatite. So siderite out on the edges and the deeper parts going transitioning into fluorite and then transitioning to barite up in the central parts of the deposit. We also have the classic sulfide zonation, pyrite, calcopyrite, mornite, calcocyte, which we'll touch on a little bit later. There's also a polymetallic uh, lead, silver, zinc signature there. There's also granite related moly tin tungsten anomalism in the deposit. The three uranium minerals are uraninite, coffinite, granite, and there's three styles of gold mineralization. The colored things, that, the, the colored areas that we see within the deposit, go ahead and just wig it around a little bit. That's what we call that purple one is our barren quartz hematite breccia. We'll talk more about that or thank you. And then the other ones are some of these, some sediment packages that we'll address more later on. And the really important thing is a lot of these faults that haven't been published a lot in the past. So if we think about the system, again, it's, 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 uh, it's a granite and that granite's been progressively replaced by iron oxides plus a few other little things left over. And we're gonna start at the, that upper little plate. And that upper little plate is the Roxby Downs granite. It has about 3% iron in it. And as we move in towards the deposit, you just get a progressive increase in the iron content and a depletion just of about everything that existed in that granite before, an addition of iron oxide, plus probably about 60 other elements that go along with that. The, the breccia textures can be quite complex, even though those little panels look pretty simple to distinguish. When you're actually looking at the rock, there's really no sharp boundaries in between any of those. It, it's really chemical definition. But the breccias actually, the breccias reveal a lot, the textures, but it's still not enough to understand. So we actually drop back a little bit and say, let's just fall back on the geochemistry. So there's very clean systematics to the geochemistry there, and that's why we rely very heavily on it. The, the lower diagram, the lower graph, shows just potassium versus sodium. And there's all kinds of different alteration indices you can look at within the deposit we use a lot and publish a lot of different other ones around, but these ones actually work to show. So we start off in, in the relatively fresh Roxby Downs brand, it's got some sodium in it. And as we progress from, the, from way out in the deposit, way out in the, in the granites towards the deposit, what we see is we go along this array and what we're doing is replacing plagioclase by sericite. We wipe out all the plagioclase, get down here, and the vector vectors actually change. And so, what the next step we're doing is really destroying the alkali feldspar in the rock, which is it was actually about 50% of the granite to start with. And we progressively deplete that potassium and replace that alkali feldspar by sericite as we're adding iron and iron iron in, and we continue along this path, and then we eventually start replacing the sericite, where we just end up with the, the barium quartz hematite right in the center. Another graph, the way, way to think about that is just the iron content versus the sodium potassium ratio. Again, these don't show a lot of the active, this doesn't show a lot of the rocks within the center of the deposit just as we progress in towards the edges of it, just in order to keep the graph a bit clean. We go a long array where we're actually stripping sodium out. 
we hit the edges of that, of that darker gray in the deposit, vector changes to soriacolae feldspar and starting to do sericite. It would continue along, along, add, along this arc, and it would continue along this way as we continue to add iron into the deposit or add iron oxide in. Um, and then you're left with the barren quartz hematite breccia. Some of the subordinate lithologies in there, we say subordinate, but some of them are probably far more extensive than what we, what we fully can appreciate. The sediments though are very dominant in the shallow parts of the deposit in the center, shallow parts, and then the southern, what we call the southern mine area. But we'll start off on the left-hand side. Some of these subordinate, subordinate but incredibly important components in are the alkaline, ultramafic and mafic lavas and dikes that we have there. We also have a lot younger uh, Gardner dike swarm, which is about 800 million years old. Then we also then we have the felsic GRV. There's a few feldspar ferric dacitic dikes there, but the bulk of uh, the volcanics manifest themselves as fragments inside of a, a volcanic, what we loosely call a volcanic breccia. So that just means we actually have fragments of Gala Range volcanics. And then we have these green ones in here, which are the fragments of oh, what's left over the mafic ultramafic material and in um, a sea of, of, of hematite matrix. The sediments though, which we call the really the uh, bedded clastic facies, really are, are four dominant ones with the minor ones. So one of them is, is just an interbedded sandstone and mudstone, a chlorite rich sandstone and mudstone, a, a, a mudstone really, a mudstone that fortunately has some ash beds in it, and then a polymictic volcanic class conglomerate. And these, the class in that consists of the rounded Gala Range volcanics, the felsics, and also the mafic ultramafics. Then we have a, a, a very rare occurrence of a, of a quartz rich sandstone, graduated quartz rich sandstone within the deposit. So we're going to take a look at and see some of what happens on some of these mixtures. Roxby Downs granite, left hand side, protolith. Things that we can clearly recognize once you have a lot of iron, uh, iron alteration within the deposit, lithologies become very difficult to tell what they were. Uh, the felsic volcanics, which are easy in these in these pictures, the mafic the mafic lavas and, and dikes, these all get add our components in in these sediments. So we'll show all these arrows that go everywhere. Roxby Downs granite. We recognize that there's components of that and the Gala Range volcanics, felsic Gala Range volcanics in those hematite quartz sandstones. Uh, the chlorite rich sandstones and mud, chlorite rich sandstones and mudstones contain Gala Range volcanics, but they're also dominated by the, the Gala Range, the, the mafic and ultramafic lavas that we see there, lavas and dikes. The polymictic volcanic breaches consist of, like I said, volcanic fragments and the felsic, sorry, the felsic volcanics and the mafic ultramafic. Then the tuffaceous mudstones, just very fine grain, but fortunately that there's ash layers in it. Now to help unravel some of these, the, these units, we've actually done a lot of dating on those. And this is where we've had a lot of help from student projects, various student project, PhD projects. We have the high precision CAID 10 states on, on zircons from the Roxby Downs granite, the felsic Gala range volcanics, and the tuffaceous the mudstones, but mainly that ash layer that exists within it. And that, that shows that the Roxby Downs granite, 1594 plus or minus a little bit, the Gala Range volcanics, probably subtly a little bit older, the felsic side of it. And this tuff bed is, is about 3 million years younger than that. There's some, a lot of other dating that, that it's also occurred in the hematite, and we won't touch on that heavily here. But um, the other rocks, the other units, the other bedded classic facies have also been dated and we use the lower precision um, laser ablation analysis on the zircons and those all come out about roughly 1590. Fortunately for us in the, in the mafic volcanics and the ultramafics, there's a lot of appetite and we can date those appetites also by laser ablation and we get again, 1590. You take all these things and you, Brecciate, metasomatize, brecciate, metasomatize all together, and you end up with this in member rock. It's hematite, quartz, and barite. But more importantly, we need to think about that this rock actually is more characteristic that it, all the aluminal silicates have been destroyed by time you're down at this, at this level of alteration. Ah, sulfides, I'm still on. Okay, 
sulfides within the deposit, simple hypogene deposit wide zonation. And what we don't see is, is a few mixing, a few pairs. We don't see pyrite and boronite together. We typically don't see pyrite and calcocyte and we don't see calcopyrite and calcocyte. So at the level of exposure that we have, there's no evidence of supergene enrichment there really. If it did, it's already been eroded away. We look over on the left-hand side and what we're gonna talk about the transition going from the distal deep parts of the deposit to the more proximal shallow. We see pyrite, pyrite transitions into pyrite calcopyrite area, then calcopyrite, then calcopyrite boronite, then boronite, boronite calcocyte, and calcocyte. These are very mappable features across the deposit. Pop over to the right-hand side. So based on petro, uh, uh, petrographic observations and a lot of thousands and thousands of MLA analysis and logging of 3 million meters of core, we can come up with a pretty good precipitation sequence. And it's really from earliest to later. For pyrite, we have two generations of pyrite and where they're a coarse, anhe a coarse euhedral and then a later smaller anhe anhedral variety. Calcopyrite clearly replaces pyrite and then there's new precipitation of pyrite, uh, calcopyrite also. Then we have boronite and boronite solid solutions, boronite solid solution with calcopyrite and a boronite solid solution with, with calcocyte or calcocyte diginite. Then we also have calcocyte, but that calcocyte, what we term loosely called calcocyte is actually calcocyte, diginite, jurlyite, analyte, all, all of those Cu2S-like phases that sit close together on a phase diagram. And we look at a clipping of a phase diagram and these, these relationships worked out experimentally during the mid 60s. And this is just an example at 400 degrees where we have the calcocyte, calcocyte diginite in, me in member part and then going to boronite and then moving over to calcopyrite and then with the solid solutions that exist in between experimentally worked out. We look at the photomicrographs and these are 100, 100 microns across, roughly 100, 150 microns across, just some examples. Pyrite, calcopyrite, calcopyrite and boronite together. And it looks like boronite replacing calcopyrite, but may not necessarily be. It's probably more of an exolution texture. Calcopyrite a little bit later than boronite, but probably exolution texture. Classic myrmachitic intergrowths of, 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 of boronite and calcocyte clearly exolution temperatures and then calcocyte here, but this could be calcocyte diginite jurlyite all. The really the important thing to recognize off of here, what, what we interpret from that, that these sulfides probably precipitated in the range of 350, probably 350 degrees, 350 to 400. And there is an upwards and inwards gradient of increasing copper to iron ratio, which correlates with decreasing sulfur as we go from the deeper parts of the deposit up into the shallower parts. Uranium mineralogy, the best thing to say about uranium, it's highly variable. Its systematics are not as nice as what the sulfides were. It would make my life a lot easier if it was, particularly on the processing side. But we do have three uranium minerals and that's uraninite, coffinite, branerite. We show the formulas here for them, but those are, are idealized formulas because they're far more complex than that. And you can refer to the publications for a lot more details. And that's about 80% of the uranium in there. The biggest surprise that we had is about 15% of the uranium actually occurs within hematite. And the uranium occurs within hematite as lat lattice bound substitutions, but then also as, as nanoscale inclusions of typically of uraninite. Another 5% of the uranium also occurs with the sulfides and on the whole swag of accessory minerals and things like uh, urana, uh, uranothorite, thorinite, zircon, monazite, really the rare earth minerals. We look very, very quickly at the backscattered electron images here. And on the supper one is a typical kind of breccia texture, 500 micron scale, sulfide class in their hematite class and little tiny specks of uraninite all over the place. A more typical one is, is, is the flooding of uraninite. So the scale's gone down a little bit or sorry, it's got expanded out a bit. And this uraninite is very euhedral, non-euhedral in, in shape, but it, 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 it floods the rock. Then we come down and look at a little bit of branerite, branerite very small scale and coffinite, typically intergrown with each other, but often rutels around and, and quartz is usually around highly, highly complicated textures. Then, then the real big surprise, uh, which was first 
recognized by Oriskes in 1990 is that, that the hematite actually contains a lot, of, a fair amount of uranium. And there, trust me off of this one, is that there's all kinds of little tiny white specks in here that you can just barely see. That's just the tip of the, tip of the iceberg of, of the uranium that's occurring within these hematites. What do we know from interpreting all these textures? That there's multiple cycles of dissolution and reprecipitation of uranium minerals, which is not uncommon for uranium deposit. The composition of, of uranium mineral, each of uranium minerals complex and highly variable. The typical uranium grain sizes are about 20, uranium mineral grain sizes are about 20 microns, but varies from less than one micron up to hundreds of microns. And micro veinlets of a millimeter wide are, are there, but they're incredibly, they're incredibly rare. The U minerals typically occur as disseminated grains as massive and massive aggregates. Hematite is, is the one really learned to love, like hematite to start with, you think for an old hematite, it's a major mineral in the deposit, but it contains a lot of information. Highly variable concentrations of trace elements within those hematites, they contain elevated uranium. 10 tungsten, silica, alumina, lead, rare earth, the whole swag of rare earth elements, thorium, and, and others. They occur at the PPM up to weight percent levels in a mineral that still looks like hematite when you look down the optical microscope. The, the trace elements have, have characteristic os oscillatory and sectorial zoning. Uh, the, the uranium occurs usually as uraninite but it's lattice substitution in the gear. Again, nano is nanoscale inclusions. And uh, a quote from one of our papers, there's multiple history of pseudomorphic replacement of pre-existing lithologies and minerals by hematite accompanied by corrosion, overgrowth and recrystallization. The backscattered uh, BSE images that we see on the right-hand side have really been optimized in order to, to pick out the, this chemical zoning that, that occurs within these hematites. And so the hematite is really to the gray with a little bit lighter colors in here. And, and so just to point this out, this is the big hematite grain with the zoning and, and it's picking up it quite nicely. Uh, so beautiful zoning. Then the next one is a big hematite grain here. And we can still see a remnant of a sectorial oscillatory zoning in here, but it's overprinted by a very porous hematite and a very irregular uh, inter interface between that original hematite and the later porous hematite. Sometimes you see a, a zoned hematite cut by another band, another growth of hematite, very porous. But this, this creation of porous hematite from the original uh, sectorial or the original zoned hematite causes a lot of the, the trace elements that were there as odds are lattice substitutions or as nano inclusions to coarsen up. And these coarsening up, and they coarsen up as, as the porosity starts to grow or increases in intensity. And these have important ramifications for recovering some of these elements out of, out, of, um, out, of the, out of our ore. Just one other thing we'll touch on here is that looking at zoning, and these are just laser ablation maps of a hematite grain that has beautiful oscillatory zoning and then a little later overprint on it. Uh, this is the Molly map, tungsten and, and tin. For a lot of details about, about other aspects of detailed dating, of, of hematite and the, the, the world's first iron oxide uranium lead geochronometer has been done at Olympic Dam. These are the papers to look at. Going from the nano and micro scale, we can we can zoom back out again to the scale and start applying these textual geochemical observations that we see across tens to hundreds of thousands of samples. So <clears throat> Fortunately, we have about 15,000 drill holes at Olympic Dam and over 600 kilometers of underground development that's been mapped. So using this world-class geochemical database, we're able to um, build a whole suite of uh, different alteration indices and geochemical maps. Uh, so this is again, just a slice um, of the same plan view section as our geological map that we showed earlier on. I have just rotated it to our local mine grid. Um, which is up in the top left corner for reference. Um, we, as Cathy alluded in early on, we have a, a really systematic mineralogical zonation pattern. Um, and this is uh, mapping changes of 
the physicochemical parameters of the fluid during the all-forming event. And so we can start on the left-hand side here. The warm colors are very low in the, ultra, in the respective alteration index, and the hot colors are very high. So this is mapping out those, uh, those respected zones. So first we can take a look at what we call the foot wall alteration, which is foot wall to the main um, high-grade ore body. This is mapping out the FE, FE2 plus stable um, early, paragenetically early assemblages, which typically flank the periphery of the deposit and, and wraps around at depth. These, this, is, this is characterized mostly by siderite, so an iron carbonate with, with minor chloride, and it has an elevated magnetic susceptibility um, signature, which is uh, reflecting the relic magnetite that has been subsequently overprinted by later hematite. Uh, this is a very important facies, not only for expiration vectoring, but it also tells us when we're, we're stepping out of the main uh, ore zones and into the largely disseminated um, chalcopyrite pyrite uh, uh, rich assemblage, which is typically sub 1% in copper. So we can see here just on this little arrow here, we go from Fe2 plus through towards a central part, central and shallow parts of the system to Fe3 plus stable assemblages. If we take a look at the ore zone itself, we can see we can map out this systematic sulfide zonation pattern, which I've just put on the side here, from the Fe2 plus stable minerals in the footwall zone of pyrite, chalcopyrite. Um, we then go into the most intensely hematized breaches, which typically correspond to increasing fluorite content, um, which hosts uh, most of the bornite chalcosite, which has the highest grades. The chalcopyrite bornite interface represents that Fe2 plus Fe3 plus redox um, uh, zone, uh, boundary rather, and this, this varies from being quite knife sharp to tens of meters wide. Um, so we can map out the ore zone using fluorite, the concentration of fluorite, um, which corresponds very well. If we step now to the hanging wall, the ore zone. This is essentially where the hydrolytic alteration has overprinted these assemblages. Uh, typically where we've preserved this is in the hanging wall of this main ore zone facies. What you can see here is there are certain areas within the deposit where this concentrates most highly around some of these structural zones, but it also just uh, dissipates out towards um, the, the shallow peripheral centers. Uh, so this, this can crudely be looked at from a regional perspective as we have minor isochemical albertization related to the rock speed arms granite. And as we step in closer into the footprint of the deposit, we start to see this hematite sericite footprint. The sericite itself can range from fengite to muscovite to illite compositions. And we have remnant zones of advanced argillic alteration preserved in, in parts of this system. This together with the hematite quartz alteration, these are really shallow proximal alteration types. So the hanging wall breccia is shallow proximal to distal alteration type, which represents a sort of um, uh, acidic outflow, uh, but is incredibly buffered by the felsic wall rocks. MQ conversely, it concentrates mostly in the proximal central shallow parts of the system and is mostly preserved in the central to, to southern parts of the deposit. It is bounded by uh, some of these major faults that are also spatially controlling the better clastic facies. And what we see here is another major redox boundary where we go from predominantly sulfide bearing assemblages through to sulfate bearing assemblages where we see uh, the concentration of barite up to a few to 10 weight percent from carbonate on the periphery. This is demarcated by significant alley depletion. And HEMQ is, has been recognized at other IOCG deposits, namely Prominent Hill, which Tobias gave a, a, um, a snapshot last week using a very similar alteration index. Um, so it is, it is quite a mappable, predictable feature. These alteration indexes are really important because it gives us insights into the deposit scale structural architecture being mostly hosted in a rock speed granite, uh, we're very limited in structural markers. So that's very annoying. 
Um, but we can use this extensive geochemical database to help us understand different levels of alteration facies in the crust. And then where we see stark differences, we try to investigate whether that's a structural feature and what's the timing of that structure. So to give you a bit of an insight into some of the sin mineral structures that we do get to see, this is an example of um, a granite out in the peripheral parts of the Northern mining area. You can see here, it's mostly intact. It mostly looks like granite. It's been uh, hydrolytically altered intensely. Um, so most of the feldspars are no longer present. It's mostly sericite. But you can see that the granite forms these really nice rhombic shapes. And this is related to these fractures that are coming through. And I've again orient, reorientated our geological map um, to line up with the orientation of this wall. So we can take a look at this, these fractal structural patterns. So we can see these major domain bounding east northeast, uh, east northeast faults and true north, these ones here. And we can see these intersections of these underlying northwest faults, which is north south in this grid. As we step in closer to the deposit, we start to see this granite become far more fragmented. It gets fragmented down to a smaller size fraction. And these rhombic blocks, which you can still make out on the peripherals here, they start to get rounded off by more intense hematite sericite alteration. And again, we can draw the sort of um, underlying structural controls there. This is just repeated brecciation and hydrothermal alteration in these structurally focused zones. And this is where we start to see um, texturally the granite start to fragment down to a very small size fraction and a hematite matrix prevail. And so Michelle Jabrak actually did a really neat study a few years ago on a couple of Olympic Dam samples. And this is a bit of a, a left field um, view, but we can actually look at the fractal dimension and circularity of the breccia class of a few breccia hosted deposits that was presented. And so you can see OD clearly stands out from the crowd of this small subset, um, but it's, it's representing its fragmentation history. So we can look in the central part where the class is semi-angular semi in terms of circularity and fractal dimension. And this is what a representative um, sample may look like. You can see this is a polyphase breccia. Um, you can see all the remnant granite class, which are completely hematized now. These are all mostly subangular. You can see earlier hematite with sulfide breccia class in there as well that have been fragmented. So this is a a very complex history of brecciation, but the most important thing is these are quite subangular classed here. Um, and this is about, you know, sort of around 1% uh, um, copper. As we step to this extreme end member here, this is very high grade copper in the hematite breccias in the central parts of the Northern Mine area. This is where the sample was. And what we can start to see is we can still see relic granite class. The quartz grains look very cloudy white. They've actually been sub-rounded to rounded now. We can see um, a plethora of class of varying generations that have mostly been hematized or and end or sulfide has, has some sulfides. Uh, but the, the classic um, fragmentation texture here is a lot of these class have now been rounded to sub-rounded. They have very wispy and cuspate edges. And so this correlates with increasing fluorine content as we get to the central parts of the ore body. And it's where the hydrothermal system is now overpowering the initial physical processes that were controlling that earlier brecciation. And this is just an excellent um, analogy. Uh, this isn't a picture of Olympic Dam. This is from actually the Aria Hotel in Las Vegas. So if you're ever around Vegas, uh, this is the Western exit uh, out to the strip, but this, when I saw this, it was just fantastic. It was a fantastic um, altogether analogy of Olympic Dam, which, which we showed in the underground photos just before. But what we see here is we see these major domain bounding structures in this slab. We can see the intersection of these other structural trends. Um, here, these big rhombic granites, they have all these second and third order structures, and this is scale and variant. This is the point. You can see minor alteration and deformation around there, but it's really that the, the edges of these rhombic blocks start to become rounded and intensely fragmented. 
And so we start to get these matrix supported hematite breaches on the rounded corners. And also the most intense zones of hematite alteration and brecciation lie right along these major structural boundaries at these intersection sites. And then the alteration of brecciation, brecciation dissipates out in a quite predictable manner out towards the edges. So this is actually a very excellent scale invariant analogy for Olympic Dam. And that little cartoon diagram is just representing those rounded rhombic blocks. So a very important thing that we can do is use the deposit scale uh, drill hole database to our advantage uh, to map all these trends out. So this here is over about 15,000 holes, over three and a half million meters of drill core. And we're displaying copper in true north. And the red zones are plus 3% copper going out to a 0.5% um, halo around the deposit. So we like to view Olympic Dam at two, fundamentally two scales. We have a bulk tonnage, low grade, disseminated chacopyrite pyrite assemblage which is mostly located in the foot wall and hanging wall fasces, alteration fasces. This is fairly homogeneous and it slightly increases towards the geographic center of the deposit. What's most important for us as an underground operation is this lower tonnage, very high grade subset, which is where we get these hematite breaches with fluorite and two plus percent copper typically. You can see these are hosted in very discrete zones uh, which is mostly bornite chaka site with some chaka pyrite rich zones. This approximately represents our total ore reserves. We can do a geometric analysis of all these different ore trends, and these are just stereo net plots of not all, but, but a lot of our high grade ore trends. And what you can see, it's not like the disseminated sulfides around the periphery, which are largely isotropic. These are structurally focused um, ore shoots with strong anisotropies. And you can see with their stereonets that they have extremely variable geometries. Now, most of these are interpreted to still represent their sin, their sin mineral control, but we're just seeing them segmented into little zones. So we go from relatively flat dipping geometries um, through to vertical geometries with varying degrees of plunge. Um, and this reflects the underlying structural control where we get the most intense brecciation and highest fluid rock interaction. Chemical dissolution processes overpower the initial physical brecciation. And these are excellent local dilatant zones of these structural intersection sites. So another excellent structural marker are these alkaline ultramafic and mafic dikes. We can see on this map, the, the lime green or bright green color is the overall distribution of coherent and fragmented dikes um, that are 1590 in age. And the darker green is the 820 million year Gairdner dolerite dike swarm. Over on the top right image, this is a picture of an olivine ferric picrite um, through to this, what we call locally a waxy sericite dike. So it's so intensely altered, but this is what we interpret as lamprophires. So we can actually, um, Using just basic geochemistry, we can map at least four different generations of the 1590 mafic ultramafic dikes, and they're geochemically distinctive to the Gairdner dolerite. But the key point here is these dikes um, are controlled along these major boundaries, which give us insights to some of the structures that were active pre and sin mineral um, mineralization. We can also see that the Gairdner dolerite dikes are utilized in the same underlying structural architecture that concentrated the deposit. So we can see in the, in the deposit, we have this underlying northwest elongation of the system, and we have these major east northeast trending faults. This one is a major regional trans lithospheric fault. And so it's likely at this intersection that initially concentrated uh, the breaches, the magnetism, and the hydrothermal, hydrothermal fluid flow. We can then overlay this image with very high grade copper. So this is greater than five weight percent. Um, so you can see that this very high grade copper is also concentrating at the zones of these, these major structures, particularly at their intersections. And they're, they're, they can be hosted in or occur around these dikes. Um, and similarly, when we load very high grade gold, so this is two, what we call high grade gold, it's two and a half gram per tonne. Um, so we can see here that they're 
the distribution of very high grade is controlled by these structural domains. Now, this is some fantastic samples of where um, the dikes themselves can get mineralized. They, they are excellent chemical traps. They're very chemically reactive, but the dikes have a very uh, diverse um, age range. They can be before, during, and just after mineralization. So we, we have a range of, of different hosts there in those, in those structurally focused zones. So we can link a lot of this back and start to, to reflect on some of the earlier work that was done through the 1980s and early 90s. Um, so the image on the left here is the classic um, Reed et al. paper in 1990. This is figure two, their geological map. We modified it slightly to, to color in their units um, to roughly match our legend. Uh, so going from Oxpedown's granite through to granite and hematite breaches. You can see here that the distribution of hematite quartz breaches are fairly um, accurate still today. And the biggest inference are these green um, rock types, which are interpreted as volcanoclastic rocks. These were interpreted as diatreme structures. And the most important um, part when reflecting on these, these papers, they have excellent observations. Um, and the interpretations are only good as the data that's available at the time. And so as, as we're very fortunate today to have over three and a half million meters of drill core and 600 kilometers of underground development. And so we can compare that to our current drill holes today. And it's really opening up the central southern area of the deposit has given us incredibly excellent insight into what just exactly what the distribution of these rock types and alteration sequences are. Um, and so these green units here out here where there's really not much exposure, um, this is actually a continuous package of the better clastic facies. These are actually the green sandstone mudstones, the cache unit, um, and they continue right up, up to there. And the, a lot of this green unit here is actually the tefaceous mudstone and volcanic and, and volcanic class conglomerate. Um, so in the modern context, um, we can look back at, at the, the classic Reeve et al schematic east-west cross-section. We can see all these principal features out here in the, in the west and eastern flanks of the deposit. They still hold very true, the recognition of the Gairdner Dyke, et cetera. Um, and all of the observations of these earlier papers are, are fantastic. The, the figure plates are fantastic. Um, and all we see is over time, um, with new data, our ideas changed about how this deposit is formed. So we started with strata-bound sedimentary hosted deposit through to a sedimentary basin hosted um, hydrothermal system and into a diatreme. And so we can take a look at a modern day section through the central part of that reef cross section. That part of the cross section was probably the lowest um, confidence in terms of data. Um, that was available. Now we, you can see the black traces of drill holes, the underground development following them quite closely. Now have a lot of drill hole data. And what we can see with this, the fundamental learnings we've had over time is this hematite quartz alteration has a, has a bottom and it is spatially associated with these sedimentary units, um, which are up here. So this is the conglomerate and tefaceous mudstone with some interbedded mudstones and sandstones. These are fault bounded downthrown blocks. Um, similarly with the HEMQ, it's, it's controlled by these high angle normal faults um, with a lot of these low angle normal faults um, also controlling some of these, uh, some of the hematite wretched geometries that we see hosting the high grade copper, which is in the red and gold and yellow. Um, so using all of this uh, data and understanding, um, we're able to to have these data-driven changes to our geological understanding. And so that gives us great insights into the SIN, pre -SIN mineral structural architecture. Uh, and now we can step to another, a slightly different section. This is a composite long section, the section lines are shown here. And so starting from the north to the south, uh, we can see one main feature is this relatively flat unconformity um, with the Adelaidean um, cover sequence that Cathy mentioned before overlaying. In the north, we have these major east-northeast trending faults that are 
it's um, mostly vertical. These are quite deeply penetratively, uh, deeply penetrating faults, and they control a lot of the ultramafic mafic dike emplacement. Most of the northern ore body is actually a long strike of this section, so it sort of goes in and out of this page. The most important features to highlight is once we hit this major Oriskes fault, this is a major domain bounding fault. This was likely a major normal fault during the, the formation of the deposit, as with most of these east northeast trending faults. This is where we actually see um, the diversity of structures, geometries, and the distribution of these sedimentary facies um, come into play. Once we get to this major regional fault called the Jubilee Fault, or locally we call it the Mashes, um, this is a 150 meter wide fault zone. It is definitely a zone of major crustal weakness. And we've seen this fault reactivate over several times throughout Olympic Dam's history. Typically, whenever there's a major deformation event through the Gawler Craton, we can record at least hydrothermal disruption, but also structural modification of the deposit, which usually centers around this fault. And then the intersecting second and third order faults controls those fluid pathways. We can see here that there's a major juxtaposition as we head south of this fault. We actually see a large volume of these sufficial facies, these sedimentary rocks. And this is where we actually see locally the mineralization extend down to, to a roughly two, two plus kilometers. So we can see here there's a range of, of faults that we've been able to map out over the last few years uh, as we get underground exposures uh, into these areas. And it's that coupled with the excellent research collaboration efforts we've had over the last 10 years in trying to understand the, the facies characteristics and provenance of these sedimentary units. So these sedimentary units, um, the facies characteristics are not those that you'd expect in a ma. Um, they're more aligned to an intracatonic basin, a deeply, a deep lacustrine setting where it's quite low energy deposition of muds and sands. This is the bulk of this blue and pink unit, which is the cash and KMQ. We have local high energy um, depositions of conglomerate with the Asheville tuff, um, uh, which is this VASH unit. Um, so this tells us that we, we likely had a very short lived extensional event, which caused the onset of very local basins throughout the eastern margin of the Gawler Craton. We see evidence now for 1590 sediments popping up um, in lots of different places around the Gawler Craton. So this is probably reflecting a short-lived exploration, uh, extensional setting, um, but uh, that, that was locally derived by, by the volcanic and intrusive rocks community around it. Using that in context, we can then start to look at major trends that we see out here. So this is the biotite outline that Kathy mentioned. One feature that um, has always interested um, Kathy and geologists of the past is the biotite outline pinches very tightly into the deposit here, whereas elsewhere it, it goes quite extensively outward. So this was always um, postulated that it could be a major fault. And once we started drilling in this area, we targeted through holes and indeed we did find a major structure and reprocessing of seismics and, and potential field um, modeling were able to pair that with our facies observation, alteration facies alter, uh, observations and deduce that we, we expect at least a two and a half to three kilometer normal offset on what we call the Woodall fault series, these series of normal faults. So this, this controls uh, the uplift of this Roxby Downs granite here in the footwall and the down throw blocks of these very sufficient units. And so these are now juxtaposed within the Breccia complex and we can see disturbance of the 1590 zonation patterns of sulfides and alteration. But we also learned that once we got about a thousand meters below these sediments where we preserve beautiful bedding that's been overturned, um, we we start, to, we start to observe that these sedimentary rocks have actually been, were subjected to the hydrothermal alteration system and, and host mineralization. This deep hole here, uh, which was a geophysical target, ended in about two plus percent copper and one and a half gram plus uh, PPM gold. Um, so that remains open at depth. 
Um, but also drilling out these units, it, it led us to discover this quite unique and odd unit called k -grain. Thank you. This is just an odd isometric view and shown the, the, what we call the k -grain, which is these hematite quartz, sorry, quartz sandstones, bedded quartz sandstones that we talked about earlier. And they occur down here and they occur in a few drill holes. And this is, is the cache, which is the uh, the chloritic sandstone and mudstone that's dominated by, by mafic and ultramafic uh, clast in it. Just an example, we reminder of what this bed quartz hematite sandstone looks at. It, it's unusual, it's unusual, so we put a lot of focus onto it. And we had one PhD student who actually was trying to date everything possible in it, and there was appetite. Fortunately, there's a lot of appetite around, and he got a, an age of 1440 for that, a loose laser ablation age. And, and that kind of caused a little bit of, of, of controversy, we'll say, to start with. It's, it was believed for a long time that at 1590, after the Gala Range Hilded event, or the whole um, slip actually cooled down, that everything was dead on the Gala Craton Stewart shelf for almost a billion years. And if that was true, how could we get something that's 1440 down into the deposit that was 1590? A lot of work to show that, well, true or not, just a couple stratigraphic columns there, but, but these posed, as you can imagine, a lot of discussion. So we go out there and say, okay, if these are sandstones in there, um, what's their sources, you know, particularly if they're 14, 1400. The beauty of laser ablation analysis, we can date hundreds of zircons in a relatively short period of time. So that lends itself to doing this zircon age distributions from sedimentary rocks and seeing if they actually match up. So in the cover sequence, there's the Pandura Formation, which is related to uh, the Kerwalu Rift Basin, a little bit younger than the deposit, but it's, it's distribution of the zircon distribution, sorry, of the samples from the deposit itself. Have this, so we have the 1590 peak, and then there's a little bit older, and then there's Archean one. So we go down and find where the Pandura, when we believed it was Pandura, but kept on saying it can't be Pandura because it's 1440, the deposit really quieted down after 1590. You go around the around Olympic Dam where the, the Pandora formation still exists at Acropolis, Emily Bluff, Oak Dam, Weird Well, some of those deposits we pointed out in the earlier, in one of the earlier diagrams. And you can collect samples for the Pandora, do zircon separates from it all, and the poor bugger, you see a thousand, thousand data points off of that. You get the same age distribution as that. So we just right away started saying, very likely that it's Pandora. There is a, a younger sedimentary sequence that's, that sits above Olympic Dam, or sorry, that sits elsewhere on the Stewart Shelf, but not Olympic Dam. It's called the Wireless Sandstone. It was a, a probably pretty good, uh, the best next best hit that we could look at. And you see the zircon distribution. You still have this peak at 1590, a little bit more in here. You still have the little Archean one, but the big difference was that it was the presence of a big zircon population between you know a thousand and, and really about 1300 million years. So that keeps on going back to tell us, well, this deposit, first of all, that we probably have material that's around, that's probably Pandura that's in that deposit. And if it's in the deposit post-1590, actually, how is it possible? So what we're gonna do is kind of summarize a lot of these events. The beauty, again, in modern time, we can date things very, very, very quickly. And the laser ablation has actually changed our world, for our world and a lot of others on what we can actually understand down at the microscopic scale. A timeline here, a timeline that shows, goes from 1.8 billion years to about 500 million. And we'll start with uraninite, even though we've dated a lot of uh, zircons, apatites, monazites, iron oxides, which are very definitive, uh, fluorite and carbonates. So we'll just talk about the uraninites. Now, uraninite was first dated by Norm Truman, in, in 1986 and 19, uh, 1986 at Cambridge of all things, an old ion probe there. And, it, and he got some dates that just didn't match with what people believe should be there. James Johnson, you know, um, almost a decade later doing his PhD work, who didn't end up publishing this part of his thesis, also dated the uraninites there. And he got similar, and these are actually his dates. And, and they weren't, necessarily dismissed, but because they couldn't be linked to any known regional event, they just couldn't adequately be explained. 
Then we come around a lot later and in more modern times decided to date the uraninites based on, on um, Edel Trow McMillan's PhD work. And then later Olga did some, but we also dated uraninites all over the place. The first thing that we actually picked up were a lot of these uraninites that were 1590 in age. So that, that was fantastic. So it did confirm that we did have mineralization at 1590 and not just based on zircon dating to start with. And those zircon, these uraninites were the uraninites, so little tiny uhedral ones that we saw in some of the other diagrams. But when we started dating these uhedral ones plus all kinds of other uraninites, what we see is a, a scattering, a clumping of dates at different times, but a big clumping down around this 500 million years. This, this pocket here is related to probably around the Gairdner dike time. And, and this one we really don't you know, truly know. But the uraninites actually, told us that maybe there's been a lot more post-1590 uh, thermal history, tectonal thermal history that's actually impacted on the Stewart Shelf. So linking these tens of thousands of, of, of dating ages that we have, back to um, a more holistic uh, Gawler Craton deformation framework, um, we can see that what we call the mineralizing Big Bang and, and the Gawler Slip, uh, large igneous province that was um, 1.6, 1.59 uh, billion years. Uh, but then we have the onset of the Kerry-Ballou Rift, as Kathy alluded to, with the deposition of Pandura. So this is an in, another in, intracratonic rift basin that developed, um, and only recently have we seen a um, some new work come out of that. Um, this is just local, locally constrained to Olympic Domain region, just south of Olympic Dam. So um, this very quickly buried the deposit. Um, so between 1.59 Gawler volcanisms potentially sealing the deposit and the Pandora quickly depositing on top, we were able to quickly preserve most of the, most of the deposit. But then as we see, we have these hits at 1450. This is roughly correlatable to what's called the late Kararan orogeny. This is reactivation of major shear zones and likely determination of, of the Kerivalu Basin. Then we have a very long protracted erosion and sedimentation, but a very limited geological record over what, over what is the boring billion. Um, but once we start to compare a lot of these um, age dates that we have around the Musgraving orogeny time, but we also start to link that with the structural context we have, we know that there's at least two major post-mineral structural dismemberment events at Olympic Dam, probably one related to the Kerry-Ballou Rift where we saw the onset of these normal faults and the downthrow of the sufficial fasces into the breccia complex. Um, but then we also have those sediments where they're dislocated by central strike slip reactivation, which you can see on those geological maps. So this was very likely constrained, but poorly constrained to what we think is major deformation event that occurred around 1200 to 1160. Um, so we call this, um, between ourselves, the not so boring billion, because this is where actually a lot of activity occurred on the edge of Gawler Craton and, and within Olympic Dam. We then have the Gawler Lip event where we see the Gairdner Dolerite dikes intrude the deposit. And they have minor hydrothermal modification on the edges. And then we have the onset of Snowball Earth, the Sturtium Maranoian glaciations, this is where we carve that flat planar unconformable surface and begin the deposition of the Adladian sedimentation in the Stewart Shelf, which is a failed rift arm of the, of the breakup of Rodinia. And that was then subsequently uh, stopped by the onset of the Delamirian orogeny and the creation of, uh, and the assembly of Gondwana. This is where we actually see a lot of textual and, and dating evidence for not so much major structural modification, but major hydrothermal modification and potential addition of uranium. So we can relate these back to the major supercontinental cycles and fundamentally deduce the most important ingredient to discover a large IOCG deposit like Olympic Dam is understanding the post-mineral deformation and preservation. And this is quite poorly understood through the Stewart Shelf, um, but it's also, um, a very important thing to consider for global ISCG systems. So to summarize, uh, unraveling this complicated evolution, typically the more data we get, the more ideas and, and, and raises more questions and answers. So knowing that over the last 10, 15 years, we've got a very good appreciation of 
of the IOA IOCG deposit spectrum from a mineral system point of view and very systematic and detailed understanding of alteration zonation patterns. So Louise Corovo and others have done some great work summarizing and putting these forward over the last 10 years. So we understand that these are sort of zoned through the crust as, as a bit of a continuum. And at the most prospective part of an IOCG with the copper and gold uh, deposits form at the shallowest crustal levels of the ore forming system within the top one kilometer. So at Olympic Dam, the present ore body geometry does not reflect the pre and sim mineral structural architecture. Rather, we're preserving remnants, um, but we can still use our vectors to try and understand what that looked like. This is, over, this is caused by the overprint of major multiple regional local scale deformation events spanning over a billion years, which have dismembered the deposit and importantly preserved the best parts, the shallowest parts of the system. And throughout, those, throughout that billion years, we've seen major fluid remobilization events and hydrothermal disruption throughout the deposit corresponding to major supercontinental cycles. So a very common characteristic of supergiant ore deposits is upgrading via secondary enrichment post initial ore formation. And Olympic Dam is really no exception. And so since discovery over 45 years ago, we've drilled over three million meters of core and 600 kilometers of underground exposures. This has allowed us to collect a huge amount of new data sets, not just geochemistry, but all the way through across the spectrum of analytical methods and develop um, some new ideas with research collaborators. And to sort of conclude here, this is actually a really fantastic sample. The height is about uh, 40 millimeters. Um, here is a heterolithic or a, you know, a polymictic hematite breccia. We see these green class here that are calcite altered. These are actually fragments of the 820MA Gerdner dolerite dike, which you can see all through here, um, sitting within a reworked hematite breccia. Um, so this, these very hot dikes intruded along the flanks of the deposit and uh, actually reworked very locally some of the breccias. But this is just a fantastic example of, of post-mineral modification that we see at Olympic Dam. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks very much, Open Kathy and Jesse. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. There was a fantastic detailed exploration of this, this, this Olympic Dam deposit. It was super interesting. And I love to see this progression of the big data over, over the years and, and how much you can now find from um, uh, in comparison to when, when the exploration started out. Um, it was fantastic. And, Amazing photos, by the way. Thanks so much for putting them all together and, and sharing them with us. Um, yeah, so I think we'll start with the discussion. So the first question is from Ken Cross, and uh, he's asking you, how do you reconcile your 350, 400 degree estimates for the main um, Olympic Dam Breccia complex hematite ser sericitite zones with the absence of hydrothermal biotites and amphiboles and the abundance of very delicate sulfide textures, especially the chalcocyte series minerals. Did you get yeah. that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> uh, uh, and Ken, were, Ken was my predecessor at Olympic Dam long before I got there and, and one of the, the giants that we consider from Olympic Dam too. Um, 300, 350, 400 is probably a little bit probably excessive, Ken, it sh I should have actually said 300, probably 300 to 350. Um, the sulfides are, it's, 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 it's very tough question. So the, the sulfides in general, we think they've all been recrystallized and that recrystallized could have because upset that whole scene a little bit. I can't throw in with the destruction of biotite in there. Um, maybe Jesse can, Add something on with that? Yeah. I suppose that was specifically referring to the sulfide yeah. precipitation, yeah. Um, that temperature. Obviously, the bulk of the hydrolytic alteration was as the fluid was continuing up through the sequence and up into the upper parts of the crust beyond the organs where the main mineralizing was, that's probably going to be lower temperature. Yeah. And, and then obviously getting to the near surface environment. Um, where we do see a whole array of sub subsurface like boiling textures and 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 other examples of near surface te textures that are probably lower temperature. So um, that 
and seeing yeah. the main sulfide zones within the actual yeah. central part. And, and I, let me add on to that too. That, that real cap or the ones that are dominated by cap caposite boronite. But the caposite area with that caposite digenite zeruleite, you can have high temperature version of that, but it can be down as low as 200 and maybe down as low as 150. And we know that by the time you get around the edges of the HEMQ type rock, but the old fluid inclusion work that was done uh, shows that temperatures of precipitation, not for sulfides, but even the sulfate down in there was probably at, at 100 to 125 degrees. You got me on that one, Ken. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Ken. Thanks very much, Kathy and Jesse. Okay, so on to the next question. Um, uh, Benjamin Mapani, if you would like to unmute yourself, um, you can go ahead and you know, ask your question and just let me know if you have a problem with the mic and I can ask it for you. Seems like it might not be possible. So I'll go ahead and ask it for you, Benjamin. So um, just a, yeah, a question regarding the hydrothermal fluid pulses. Um, has there been, yeah, maybe you can expand a bit on uh, the more on the dating of the different hydrothermal fluid pulses uh, for the different stages of mineralization. Um, yeah, I, I know you did, talked already a lot about the different dating, but he asked again about the different hydrothermal fluid pulses and different dates. For yeah, them. we don't have the resolution to date. If, if, if we look at Liam Courtney Davis's late last two papers, who dated the, the, dated the granite and the hematite, and you have a uh, a constraint that the bulk of the hematite precipitated about 2 million years after the, the, uh, the granite crystallized or dropped below the zircon temperature. And, and that 2 million years, most dating methods cannot resolve it at when we're looking at a rock that's 1590. We would dearly love to be able to have the precision to date uraninites a lot better, to date things like apatite a lot better, and even to date the sulfides a lot better. Very, very difficult. Can't, can't resolve different pulses over that short period of time. Yeah, uh, challenging. <laughs> uh, thanks, Benjamin, for your question. Um, maybe I have a quick follow-up one on that. Uh, with your different hematite textures, uh, I found it quite interesting, the, the very porous, porous hematite. And I just wondered, yeah. like, are there any kind of additional cross-cutting factors that give you an idea how much later that that porous member is? Yeah, the off of off of Liam's Liam's work, they and he's probably shooting me because I'm not going to get the exact date right, 1590. But then there's some hint of, of uh, the hematite just a little bit younger than that, but only by a few million years. Okay. And it becomes the more porous that material becomes, it's very difficult to date that porous material because you get a coarsening of the uraninite, and so you don't know mm. actually it's not acting as a closed system anymore. So that the most pristine ages that it gets for the hematite. Is the, is the hematite that still has that oscillatory zoning in it before you start getting a coursing, before you start getting that later overprint where that, where you get the, um, uh, where you develop that porous hematite. Okay, really interesting, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we, so the next question, are you done, Amanda? No. Yes. It's from uh, Hans. So he's asking from a processing control perspective, how are the R types feeding the processes plants tracks? Um, sorry. Uh, yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there again. I, I know there is another talk about geometology after, so uh, maybe we'll yeah. go more into details, but I'll ask this. And, and, and actually, I'll do a plug for the, the Geomet talk, which is on October 21st, yeah. I think. October 21st, we can talk a lot about that. Um, extensive geometallurgy model for the whole deposit, but maybe if we can defer that question until the geomet section, that would be good. Okay. So, but in general, we blend up everything and we blend up everything to the constant thing. And there's no, there's nothing, individual rock units or individual alteration intensity can cause some processing grief, but we schedule that and we blend it. But yes, good question, let's defer it. Yeah, okay. So maybe hence you can come back in, in two, two weeks to listen to the talk. Perfect. Uh, well, then the next question is again from, from Ken Cross. I don't know if I can go ahead with that, if you're ready, guys. <laughs> um, so the 1980s interpretation was nested uh, 
Mars in an ephemeral salar in the hydrologic low of the regional rift basin, which developed into the Caril Basin. Um, sorry about that. So the Olympic Dam's breccia complex in total wasn't interpreted as a diatrim. Okay, that, that's not a question, right? Yeah. I think he's, uh, Ken's just got a bit of a comment there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, Spot on, uh, Nest, nested diatrim structures, absolutely. So the diatrim within it were interpreted to the direct results of mafic, ultramafic dike injection into the wet hydrothermal breccia system. So yeah, that was just a comment, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he's 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 right. We we're going to have more conversations with Kim about the Ken upcoming. So it's, it's very controversial, even amongst us. Ken that worked at Olympic Dam for a long period of time, and those of us that worked after Ken at Olympic Dam, open for a lot of interpretations. And ultimately, what we're going to come out with is there's swings in interpretations when we look at all major ore deposits. You know, it swings in time. They're on 20-year cycles, and we'll come back. To something in between later on, we'll, our interpretation will yeah. will change again, or the next generation's interpretation will change again. I suppose the only the only comment I have for you, Ken, is uh, is from all the all the work of the better classic fasces and the structural context we have, um, it probably probably is not characteristic of Ma fasces, um, and so that that was all the work that UTAS put out over the last uh, five or so years, mm. um, and the scale of diatremes probably aren't a principal um, control of, of the most, most of the brecciation. So, yeah, so so I, I think we can rule out the Ma from, from the FASI's characterization work of, of, the, of the sediments. And in terms of diatremes, we don't see any evidence um, textually or structurally for nested diatreme centers, but even if, even if there are some, um, they're probably not a major component of, the, the bre of, of what form most of the breccias we see. Um, and so that, that's just a comment on that, and can, which we can discuss inevitably at a later date. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Sounds like there's going to be some really good discussions after this as well. So, um, okay, we have another question here from Doug. Um, thanks, Doug, for your question. I'll ask it for you. So Doug asks, uh, great presentation. Um, could you speculate how much of the deposit has been eroded? Yep. Yep. And, and can you tell me if that's Doug Haynes? Does, does it say Doug? I don't have just a last Doug. name, I'm afraid. I just got Doug. Okay, okay. that's okay. <laughs> okay, that, that's cool. Uh, anywhere from 500 meters to more than a kilometer of the deposit has been removed. So a lot of the really definitive textures that would help probably help on some of the controversy about the origins of the deposit have been eroded away, yes. you know, <laughs> which makes it very, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And, and the likewise, the same thing for all the occurrences on the Stewart Shelf for Gola Craton of other IOCG deposits, mainly on the Stewart Shelf, there's been a significant amount of erosion off the top parts of them. So we just don't see the full system exposed. And, and just, uh, just how do you estimate that how much has been eroded? Yeah, and, and good question. And when I first started there, Ken Cross, who was my, who was my boss or or my, my mentor there, um, doing the transition from looking from when going from coherent dikes, mafic dikes to fragmental dikes to what he was calling tuffocytes at the, at the time, did that very rough estimate you know, of, of five, at least 500 meters, but it was a change in, in the, the nature of the mafic dikes. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Another important thing is, so we have evidence for Pandora formation within the deposit, um, but what makes us a bit different is all the prospects around Olympic Dam actually have a thick pile of Pandora sediment still preserved um, as, as a disconformity. Um, so we, we have no Pandora preserved above, you know, above the ore system. So whatever Pandora was deposited above OD um, was eroded away and probably took some of the deposit away. Yeah. Um, as well as those later glaciation events, which have carved that flat planar surface, also gives us insights to this deposit was exposed at the surface and, and eroding. So it had about a billion years of various events to expose it to the surface. And, and that lack of thick pile of Pandora has probably given us evidence that a, a significant portion was actually eroded. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. 
Okay, um, Marin? Yeah, so the next question is from John. John, you're unmuted if you want to go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is for Kathy. Um, there was something I didn't quite grasp in your district scale geological map. You've got the, the deposit is hosted by an intrusive, which is not the uh, Roxby Downs granite. And this is characterized by primary biotite. But the impression I got when you were describing this was that that other intrusive also corresponded with the limits of a uh, very weak uh, hematite metasomatism. Is that right? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question, John. I wasn't, probably wasn't clear enough. The Olympic Dam Breccia complex and the, and the deposit itself is, they're hosted within the Roxby Downs granite. And that Roxby Downs granite has the transition going from the, from the fresh granite, we won't say pristine, but the fresh granite into the breccia complex, which then where, of which where the ore occurs within the breccia complex itself is all in the, in the um, Roxby Downs granite. Okay, great. What was, yeah. what was the thing you mentioned about primary biotite? I, ah, I kind of... that it, it's, a, it's a good marker of, of going from fresh rock or fresh granite into a granite that's been significantly altered. There's all kinds of other chemical uh, indicators in there that tell us that. But when you're just looking at drill core, when you, you see changes in the colors of the feldspars and all that, but all of a sudden you, do, you don't see any more biotite. And once you don't see any more biotite, the, the hydrothermal, the magmatic magnetite's also been completely converted over to hematite. Um, it might it might have some magnetic uh, magnetite in there, but there's all kinds of changes that occur, you know, at that point. And so, at that point is then when you start to really start seeing uh, a gradual increase in the amount of iron. It's real dodgy because everything that we have out on the ed outer edges is based on widely spaced drill holes, you know, so drill holes at uh, 100 to 200, even further 400 meter spacing, and it's a best guess of where to put the line on where they a complex ends and and where the the fresh rocks be down granite actually starts off even, even though that's a very gradational margin yeah right thanks very much i had it completely asked about i thought the primary biotite was inside but it's inside is essentially where the primary biotite has been destroyed um yeah. via v biotite containing rock blue dams Granite. Yeah. Thanks very much. Much appreciated. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, so we've got another question here from Heinrich, uh, Heinrich 2020. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Um, so in 1996, they did a geostat study um, and uranium and silver only appeared well correlated in a cross spherogram. Um, and they wondered if there was any new ideas on that subject. Yeah, that, that off of a straight geostat side, no, I can't say a lot. Uh, silver being related, ooh, I think they're, they're some of the early quality of the silver, it's precision one is, isn't quite as good as what we might thought it was. So I would just, I can't, I can't comment because I'm not a geostats person, but um, silver from back at that time would have been, you know. <laughs> So unfortunately I can't, but he, he's welcome to click me an email and we can get an answer for him. Okay, great. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead with that, Hyrus. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, uh, Marion, do you have another question there? Otherwise I, I do have a couple too. Um, no, I was, just, I was just wondering myself if you could see any, um, any zonation in the uh, sodic alteration close to the um, or zone, like where the biotite is really close from the or zone. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go? So, so the, <clears throat> we had a PhD student, Alcus, um, do a lot of work looking at the albertization of the Roxby Downs granite. So um, a lot of those widely spaced surface holes, that, Kath, that drill holes that Kathy was referring to before, um, was the subject of his study. Um, and so what, we have very, very um, small amounts of albertization 
that's preserved in the rocks of Um And it really represents a post-magmatic hydrothermal deuteric coarsening um, related to the rocks of granite itself. Um, we don't see extensive sodic calcic alteration uh, like, like other IOCD districts, um, but one could postulate that it may likely exist well below the, what we've seen at Olympic Dam. Um, so geophysical mm -hmm. studies, seismic, um, this, we've got two seismic lines that go across Olympic Dam and, and MT data and a whole lot of central field and electrical methods. What, what these highlight is there's this resistive low um, directly beneath Olympic Dam. Um, and this may correlate with, with either an extensive zone of graphite or potentially um, sulfides with magnetite. And potentially this is a sodic altered, sodic calcic altered um, alteration uh, that's pretty typical of IOCG systems that have this are usually ones that have been exhumed and you're getting close to, this, to really the, the depth or the source of the system and we're really preserving the shallowest part. So um, I, I, I refer you back to Alcus's work um, on the, on the um, alphabetization. Yeah, what, what you don't see in the granite is, is there's a, there, there's a weak, there's albite alteration, but it's almost like an isochemical alteration that you see. So you have a reshuffling of the phases, but there's no net addition of sodium into that rock. In fact, as soon as you start altering it, there's a net, net stripping of it out. So we're shallow enough in the, in the full spectrum of IOCG deposits that we're way above where any of that sodic alteration, that intense sodic alteration would occur that we're all used to seeing in other deposits around other IOCGs that have a lot of magnetite in them that we're just, we're just in the shallower faces. So we're dominated by hydrolytic alteration versus the calcic sodic alteration that you'll see in other ones. And again, that, that's part of the reason that we probably have so much boronite caprosite is because we're very shallow. Okay. Thanks. So maybe maybe in forty years, yeah. when we're going for 0.1 percent copper at four kilometers depth, maybe we'll get some better insights <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. to what's really down below on the big dam. Great. Um, are, are you both okay for another five minutes? We've got still a, a few more good questions here. Sure. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So um, Tobias Schlegel, uh, speaker from the other week, he says he's very sorry he doesn't have a mic today, but he does have some great questions. Um, and he says, thanks very much for the talk. Um, so his, his first question is, uh, do you think that the rather complex faulting helped to preserve the core part of the ore deposit? Uh, absolutely, Tobias. Um, so so what, we, what we look at is, um, is those sedimentary units that are in the central part of the system. Um, but they're excellent because they give us a structural marker. Um, so you can imagine faults offsetting granite, even though they're altered, it can be very difficult to actually work out um, how important those faults are in terms of displacement. Mm -hmm. But the understanding the, the sediments has been really important. So then we can use that as a context to then look at where do we see major disturbances of the alteration facies and this is where we actually see a major disturbance in the sulfide zonation pattern that we see. Um, so we, if you, you think back to that cross section where the very fresh rock spit down granite uh, that was bi magmatic biotite stable, it comes right up against the southern flank of the deposit. And then within 100 meters, you have um, via the Woodall normal fault, um, all the sediment. Oh, sorry, do you see? Cut out. The last like uh, five seconds, not much. Okay, so as you go, you basically have the pyrite stable assemblages um, to basically not really much sulfide at all in the fresh rocks beyond granite. And then you immediately go into the barren sediments to bornite stable down through the chuckle pyrite, pyrite. So, and then once we go into the foot wall um, on the other side of the antithetic normal fault, um, you go back into the normal. Um, sulfide zonation patterns. So there's definitely a major kilometer scale disturbance of the zonation patterns, as well as we've now preserved the shallowest parts of the sediments. And these are these are sort of blocks of sediment, but internally the sediments actually show mostly conformable contacts. So we've actually downfolded a sort of a lochmanous block of the different sedimentary facies. And most of the bedding is actually quite pristine and they're all uniformly overturned and dipped to the Northeast. Mm. 
Um, and so that, that's also a very cool structural context that these are not in situ, so to speak, um, of where they were deposited, that they've actually had some significant deformation. Great, thanks, Stacey. <laughs> okay, we have another one from Tobias. Um, uh, okay, can you comment on where in the deposits the native copper occurs? Is it irregularly distributed in the hematite breccia or around in proximity to the hematite quartz breccia or somewhere else? In a variety of different in a variety of different spots, but it's part of the natural transition of going pyrite, calcopyrite, boronite, calcocyte, and a little bit of copper oxides, very trace amounts and very minor amounts of, of, of native copper. So just continue stripping the system of sulfur with a little bit of copper around. As we look more and more at it, we think that some of the native copper areas are actually associated with, so closely associated with mafic dikes in there. But besides this being a normal transition of, of going from sulfides to oxides to native metal, um, that there could be some local effects due to some of the mafic dikes. We do we do have a, quite a nice example of native copper, quite um, quite deep. Mm. probably 600 meters below surface in the northern parts of the mine area, which is that likely association with the mafic dikes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it like in the, sur like the surrounding rocks of the mafic dikes or in the mafic dikes themselves? No, it's, it's on the rocks that are just surrounding it, sure. you know? And so it's, in, and it's, it's very loose, but it's, it's very rare there. Um, and, and when it's there, you might have all my time there, I might've seen three or four drill holes, you know, out of 10,000 that have a little bit of native copper in it, but it's there. And, and it's, clearly, it's clearly in rocks that have of calcocyte, the native copper is with quartz typically. Um, and in more modern times, we, we see some of that more associated with, with some of the mafic dikes, but not in the dike itself, but off on the edges of it, so. Okay, it, do you think it's like, the fluids kind of mobilizing along the dike edges or like are they providing like extra channels somehow or do you, you know what, what? Is the I relationship? Don't, I, yeah I don't have a clue I okay. honestly <laughs> can't ask that. you know I always fall back on I've just stripped the system of all of its sulfur and there's still a little bit of metal hanging around yeah. and it can eventually precipitates out you know but okay. that I don't know because it, it's so rare there and mm -hmm. what makes Olympic Dam difficult is there's not classic cross cross cutting relationships. So in any big parcel of rock that I look at, I can find all kinds of things in it. But you always look for what's the most dominant feature in that rock. And and we would dearly love to have micro veinlets all over the place with cross cutting relationships. That would make our life so much easier, you know. And working out parigenesis and all that. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, it would it would be nice if that happened there. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. And Tobias says there in the chat. Thanks very much for your detailed answers. Um, we also have one one comment, final comment there from uh, Ken. Uh, the presence of fresh primary sulfides and the unconforming suggests the uh, Sturton uh, Marinian uh, glaciation to a major, possibly only erosive event that removed the part the upper parts of the deposit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yep. Um, maybe as a final question. So in, in terms of outlook, what is like the next steps in terms of like geochemical analysis or sort of dating? Is, is this something that you're still looking for uh, to really nail down and like explore the deposit yeah. even more? Right now we're trying to date the material along the faults. So uh, during Ken's time at Olympic Dam, there was a, a structural geologist there named Tim Sugden and who did a lot of the early structural work on the deposit. Uh, I believe that the initial dating, trying to date some of the sericites at that time, we're going back and trying to date some of the, um, at least some of the movements on the faults on some of the bigger ones that we're seeing in the South. So, so that's a packet of work that, that's starting right now. Pretty, pretty difficult to do, but we're gonna go back and revisit that. And our other big packet of stuff that's going on right now is revisiting fluid inclusions fluid inclusions, mountain inclusions out all the way from the granite and going in towards the deposit with our modern understanding of, or what we think is our un current understanding, which our understanding, our, our honestly, our understanding changes all the time, you know? Yeah. Great. And, and are you doing some, 
are you able to do some uh, laser work on those fluid inclusions as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. So doing laser uh, Raman analysis on the fluid inclusions, so all the latest, latest and greatest that we can do, we're doing them on there. Yep. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like we've got a lot of uh, more interesting work to hear about in the future as well. Um, cool. Yeah. So thank you both very much for joining us today, for giving us this really detailed uh, insights into the Olympic Dam deposit. Super interesting. Um, and yeah, we're very much looking forward to hearing the geo geometrology follow-up in a couple of weeks, Kathy. Definitely. Okay. And if you're thank still you. awake. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having us. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you.